Hi, Roger Magolis here with Tim O'Reilly and Rob Thomas, and we're here to talk about topics that were raised in the keynote today uh, around the AI ladder, a paper that you recently wrote. Maybe you just want to give us a quick background on the, on the paper itself. This was something that came to me. I remember I was sitting in a hotel room and was trying to think about how do we help clients go make progress with AI. And I realized that in most of the clients I was working with, the issue was actually more on the data side. And so I started thinking about what do you have to do? You have to be able to collect data. You have to be able to organize data. You have to be able to analyze data. And then ultimately, once you build models, it's about how do you infuse them into your business process to really change the way that you're working. So it's something that we've been testing in the market for a while now. Clients kind of respond to the idea of helping them along this journey. Mm -hmm. That's great, and it, it makes a lot of sense. It jives with a lot of what we've been hearing from events like this and stuff. Um, one of the things I, I really like about it is your notion of running experiments and stuff and uh, a portfolio of things. And from my perspective, it seems like the kind of non-deterministic nature of AI projects is part of it, and just that it's going to give you insights you can't really explain. Maybe we can dive a little into that perspective on it. This is very much a, I would call a, a builder's market where people have got to get their hands on the tools and go try things. It's not a build a nine month strategic plan and then build a huge team. It's about pick a problem that you've always wanted to make better predictions or you wanted to automate something or you're trying to optimize a business process and go give it a try. These projects should be very iterative. And Tim, you talked about on the stage, you know, traditional agile approaches. Five to seven people, six to eight weeks, then you decide if you keep going. You know, there's something else about the AI ladder that I think is really important. AI has had so much hype attached to it that everybody kind of comes away with it, this sort of binary. It's either, you know, the complete self-driving car, you know, and then everybody goes, well, it didn't really work. It's not doing as well as they thought. So even the, the big dudes can't do it. So therefore, this thing is overhyped. Uh, or, uh, you know, it's nothing, you know. And, and part of what the latter gets across is, yes, there's this sort of, you know, these very futuristic projects that kind of come to resent, you know, kind of be AI in people's minds, but there's actually a series of steps that you use to get there. And so companies are kind of like, they think, well, what's that one big win that we could have, like the one that, you know, Google's working on? And that's not the right way to think about it. It's like, you know, you, you, know, you want to get up there, but you start at the bottom of the ladder and you, you, you do a bunch of of work to get ready, and then you do a bunch of small projects, and you gradually build your competency, rather than you know you go oh I got I got to get me some of that AI magic, and, and I'm going to go, you know, right. uh, to some vendor who promises to do something that sounds magical to me. Right, it's not a tumor you've been attached to the company, which I'm using that metaphor specifically because sometimes it's bad when you just buy something. Right, you yeah. really got to kind of own it. Yeah. So like the kind of cultural uh, engaging with it, and that is hard work. It is. I, I actually use the inverse phrase. I say AI is not magic. This is computer science. And it's computer science disguised as hard work, <laughs> which is you better roll up your sleeves. Mm -hmm. You better know, I would call, what are the lingua franca of the AI world is things like Python, TensorFlow. That's where the action's happening. Don't forget and PyTorch. A PyTorch. In fact, I just wrote a PyTorch classifier. And I think, <laughs> Coop, and I think Coopflow has a lot of momentum yeah. Yeah. coming on. So. And that will, that's the thing about this that makes it, I think, hard for a lot of people to get their head around is whatever we're doing today, we're probably going to be doing something different in 6 to 12 months. So this is constant learning to do this well. Yeah, the other thing that I think that we'll all wake up one day and realize that there was a class of problem that we were trying to solve using the wrong tools. And when we had the right tools, we didn't think of it yet. And that's sort of another point about experimentation. Uh, you know, we so often, you know, do the horseless carriage trick, you know, where we go, oh, yeah, wow, this is just like a carriage, but it doesn't have a, have a horse, you know, and those early cars, all, they all look like carriages. And a while later, we, we, we realized things like, oh, aerodynamics, and we, they got faster, and we were able to do so much more with them. And we are so early in this process that a lot of horseless carriages are being built. Right. And just to carry the car, the car now a little further is when cars first started, there were no roads and stuff. And I think you're bringing up that you need a catalog of data and you need to care about 
the stuff about your data, the metadata and so forth as important. And uh, you know, maybe you can, we talked about it a little in the keynote today, maybe get a little more detail on that. Sure, and I think, by the way, things like solving the data problems can also be solved with AI. Today, when we build a data catalog, we do automated metadata creation. So we're using AI to do something that there used to be a bunch of data stewards that had to do, that nobody really liked doing, but it was a means to an end. We do automated data matching using AI models. So the whole idea of governance has never been, I'd say, an exciting topic, but it's an incredibly necessary topic if you want to be successful. So it's about using AI to build AI, is where I really see this going. Yeah, and not only that, I actually think it, for any company of any size, it was impossible to do it without AI. I mean, I just don't know of a company that did a good job at it. So I think we're in a place where to do AI, you need to do AI. Well, right. that, that's exactly right. I think about all the taxonomies that we built in our data for over the years. And, and the fact is, what's so great about AI is like you just give it a big pile of data and it tells you what the taxonomy is, you know, as opposed to you, you kind of build a taxonomy and then fit all your stuff into it. It's, it's just sort of a wonderful inversion of the process. Right. You know, one thing that came to mind when we talked about the, um, the latter is kind of also the notion of Occam's razor, is looking for the kind of simplest answers to questions. Uh, I'm wondering from that kind of perspective, do you have like kind of advice for people who are getting into this from the kind of cultural and technical perspective? So this may not be very popular because AI is supposed to be all about leading the edge in a new frontier. I think half of the problems that organizations attack with AI can probably be accomplished with a logistic regression. Meaning, we don't have to overcomplicate these things. It's about understand the business problem, get the data to solve the problem, and figure out the easiest model you can use to go do that and to go accomplish that. And I think sometimes people get excited by the, the shiny object that we talked about off camera where they're thinking about, I gotta go to use this new thing. If a logistic regression can do it, or a random forest can do it, do the most basic thing. This is about the outcome. Th th that is true. Uh, I, I will say, though, that there are things that people feel like they have a really good handle on. Think about Google Search, where you know full text search was was a uh, you know a well known problem, well solved problem, uh, and then you know they try this new approach with the Google Brain. And, you know, which was their AI approach to, to the full text search, and they got better results. So they then you know, replaced the way they did it. Same thing with their, their language understanding model. Uh, they, you know, they had a set of techniques that they f felt pretty good about, and, and they did get better results. So I do think, I think you're absolutely right that you know, if, you, if you don't have massive research capabilities, you use the, the simple stuff that you know works and build up. But in that sense of running experiments, it's always worth saying, hey, we have a good solution for this problem. Let's feed it in to some of this new technology and see if it comes up with better results. Right. Yeah, so you, 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 can, you can be A-B testing until you actually, you know, it, was, you know, it could be quite a while before your, 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 your uh, AI approach actually does give you better results than that simple, but you don't want to just say, That's oh, well, right. we're not going to deal with it. Right, that's why you want hundreds of experiments. Right, that's right. <laughs> it gets back to A-B testing, experimentation. Like yeah. we, you know, we even do this in our own business where we put up a virtual agent on a website and for the first few weeks, it's really not any good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it can't answer any questions, but then it keeps learning. That's the thing, I think that what's fundamentally misunderstood by many people is these are about learning machines. So people hear machine learning, that's actually about a learning machine. It will get smarter over time. And these get way better after six weeks, after 12 weeks, and you've got to have that mentality as you go into it. Although you can make the observation, if you think about Microsoft's uh, uh, Tay, uh, you know, where you basically had a, a bot that actually learned to, to get worse, you know, learn bad behavior. True. And we see that you know, in a lot of areas of, of, of online social media in particular. It can happen. That's why I think things like anomaly detection, drift, knowing when a model is getting out of the scope of what you wanted, bias, explainability, this becomes a very big topic in companies that we work with because if you're in a regulated industry or you're making de you know, loan decisions, whatever you're doing, you kind of need to understand what the AI is doing and why it's doing that. That's right, and you also, just from a governance point of view, you really need, we actually are still at the early stages of figuring out what we need to do to govern these models and to feel comfortable that they're doing the right thing. Right. All right. I actually think it's almost an imperative. It's not just a nice to have because 
people are really good at detecting unfairness. And if you start having some early things happen that seem unfair, you're going to hurt the whole field in a way. And well, and of course, it, it, this ties right back to the latter because uh, unfairness begins in the data that you feed into the model. And so, you know, when you think about something like that, again, I think this, the, this latter concept works really well because you go, okay, if, if uh, you know, if fairness matters to us, we actually have to build fairness processes at each step of the ladder. It's not just something you apply at the end. Right. You know, I'd love to have you elaborate a little more on NLP as a nervous system of AI because I, I fundamentally believe that, and I think it's in a way underserved in the discussions as a, like a, a poor cousin to uh, image recognition. But I agree with you in the long run, it's going to be the more important piece. I uh, think people, well, people got enamored with image and voice or speech because that's how the average consumer had their first experience with AI whether it was through Instagram or through an Alexa device or whatever. But you start to go a step deeper and you say, now we want to change how enterprises work. So it's not about, it's not about cat videos anymore, it's about changing how a company works. Companies are driven by people. People convey their knowledge in a written form, most often, or in a spoken form, or unstructured text, whatever it may be. and. You have to have a way to, I'd say, unlock the insight that is sitting in what is normal human communication if you really want to make progress in a big enterprise. That's why I say NLP is ultimately going to become this nervous system where if you can do that very well, it's going to make a big difference. And there's industry benchmarks on this. The newest one's called Superglue. Human level's 87. Now we're getting some NLPs. Ours is the number one actually for a company that's getting close to that range. So we're getting almost to a human level in NLP. And these benchmarks will continue to move the bar, which is good because it challenges us to be better. Right. And is there some kind of like, not secret, but because but, this is the AI ladder, no, no secrets and no magic um, to getting better in that? Is it, is it more data? Is it more tech? Like what, what seems to be effective in the NLP space? Massive amounts of data, massive amounts of compute power. Those are the two things. And then a bunch of smart people. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the triangle of, of what you need. Because with any one of those things missing, you're not going to be able to do all that you need to do, but it's those three. But are, are there also um, different classes of human communication? Uh, this is something we talked a little bit about on stage, but there's a set of, of vocabularies that you use uh, you know, in, in consumer interaction. There's a very different set of vocabularies and, and intents and meanings in various kinds of business communication. And so, you know, for example, reading a contract is a very, very different level of sophistication, you know, than, you know, reading a, you know, a, a, a request for, you know, what song to play. Right. <laughs> I agree. So the important words you used is intent which is the best NLP systems have at their core what I would call intent classification. Right. They're able to distinguish between two completely different worlds like you right. described, or maybe worlds that are more closely related. Yeah. That is actually the secret sauce inside of an L NLP engine. So, yeah. so in a way, it's kind of do domain specificity. So if, if you know you're doing contracts, or in like our cases, abstracts of books, yep. well, that's a different context. Each of those is a different context. You probably want different yeah. data, different tuning. Exactly. Yeah, I'll be really interested to see how uh, contracts work because obviously one of the things that lawyers are very good at is putting in a very little clause in a contract that has the intent of having a very big effect that they hope nobody will notice. <laughs> oh, <I think> that's <laughs> true. <laughs> it's possible lawyers won't like this. <laughs> right, right. right. Would something be able to detect when Dan Halen used to ask for all the brown M&Ms to be removed. And they did it not because they cared about brown M&Ms, but they wanted to know if anyone read. They were looking at detail, yeah. attention yeah. to detail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in that. Uh, I'd like to get back to the kind of uh, high level people engaging with this. Like, how do you convince someone to pay attention to this in a way that other topics they might not have had them engage, like probably like even buying their ERP systems and stuff. But now you really need, you know, hearing the AI ladder story, a lot of, people who are making decisions to embrace what's going on and have this different understanding. But that's hard to communicate. I feel like this is finally becoming a board level topic for companies that I interact with. Just look at the economics. 
$16 trillion of GDP expected to be accrued from AI between now and 2030. It's hard for anybody to overlook numbers that big. Let, let's say that's off by you know, 50%. It's still a big number. So there's an economic piece. Adoption today, depending on who you believe, is somewhere between 4 to 8%, meaning companies that have s- seriously done something with AI. You take those two things, you say, biggest economic opportunity any of us will ever see in our lives, very low adoption, that's a pretty good opportunity to step into the moment and do something as a company. That's what we try to encourage people to take that step. You have a thought, Tim? No, I I think that's absolutely right. Uh, uh, I love the idea that we are building the capability to solve new kinds of problems. And that, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of it that is actually just a better way of solving old problems. But for me, the thing I get most excited about are that, you know, we're, we're growing our data universe. And we have to grow our understanding universe as well. You know, you think about things like, uh, you know, handheld, uh, you know, DNA sensors. We had a, a, our, at our science food camp there was a, uh, you know, a demonstration of this device they were using to look at some virus that was affecting cassava roots in Africa, you know, and they only could go do it, but it literally were doing handheld gene sequencing out there in the field. And you think about how compute power is going out to an edge like that, and you start adding up all of those edges. And you start, and we had a presentation this morning. That was an amazing presentation. Yeah, you know, about basically, you know, how, for example, a new crop disease or plague of insects, whatever, you know, in some, uh, you know, part of the world could have an effect on commodity prices worldwide. And you go, that's kind of like, that's the kind of stuff that we're going to be building systems that are increasingly able to sort of get in real time and start to help us respond to. And and just when I look at the arc of of history, the problems that we're going to be hitting in the 21st century are so large that we need all the help that we can get. I think so. So for people to be able to help, they need to have the right training and tools and perspective on this stuff. And I think we've certainly, as a company, talked a lot about augmentation seems the primary thing and not so much replacement of people. Um, What would you recommend to someone trying to get more into the space? Like, what should they learn? Learn everything you possibly can. There's no limit to this. We just launched some AI learning, working along with O'Reilly, and it's a lot of the basics of just finding your way around this. What is AI? Most people don't really have an intuitive understanding of what this is. And then you follow your curiosity. If you're interested in NLP, go do that. If you're interested in you know, building models, go do that. If you're interested in Python, go do that. You got to follow your curiosity, but I think we should all challenge ourselves to say this is such a big opportunity. There should be no limit to how we think about trying to learn on this topic. Well, thank you, Bo. This has really been a fun conversation, and I think we've given a lot to people to think about. So, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Thank you.